Okay, very good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. The day has arrived. It is the FOMC decision day. So it's Wednesday, the 18th of September. Just as a heads up, straight off the bat, Sam and I will be covering, and the rest of the team here in London, the full FOMC decision live via our YouTube channel. So if you don't already do so, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon, which will turn on your notifications and you'll get an immediate push on your phone. Uh, and you can join us live. So via your mobile, you'll be able to ask questions, uh, listen into the session. We're going to kick things off from 6.30 p.m. London time. That gives us half an hour to do a bit of a, a preview for what it is that we're expecting from my side fundamentally, uh, and then from Sam in a technical setup sense from a trading point of view. We'll then listen to the release, and then we'll do a bit of a, a debrief. We've also got the press conference and everything else, so hopefully you can join us for that session. So that does mean for my briefing this morning, I'm going to keep the Fed conversation relatively short because I'm going to go into that in much greater detail later on this evening. Uh, when we cover it live. So first things first, let's just have a quick look at the the overall kind of sentiment for the market open. Uh, and as you would expect ahead of that central bank decision, things are relatively quiet. The dollar index up a touch, 0.1%. Uh, cable and euro dollar trading, just minor negative territory cable at the moment. Just having a little look at its daily uh, pivot level in the futures. Uh, gold down about 4 Dollars, but again, some support seen at the overnight Asia Pacific low, but equally around its pivot level as well. Uh, the 10 year up about four ticks with just slightly negative uh, global stock futures seen this morning and overnight. So, as normally the case ahead of those big news driven events coming out of particularly the Federal Reserve, uh, it's almost like a wait and see now for how that plays out. Oil, of course. Highly volatile over the last couple of days. We had that huge record gap up and then big biggest intraday move that we've seen uh, ever. Uh, and then we had the pullback to the technical relevant levels to then surge back higher after it was a bit questionable about how quickly they could get uh, production back online at some of their key facilities in Saudi Arabia. The news broke yesterday. Uh, and let me just refresh your memories of what exactly that was. That was this, that Saudi Arabia had partially restored output at the damaged oil plant. Um, crude flow back to said to be at 2 million barrels per day. Remember, the impact overall at the beginning was understood to be about 5.7 million barrels per day. So that, even though they're saying that production capacity may not be fully restored until November, um, catching the market a little off guard, uh, given how quickly they are looking to kind of mitigate that um, that circumstance that occurred at the or the situation that occurred at the weekend. So that immediately caused some selling pressure. But again, finding, although a bit messy, some support around the same type of level that we did on the initial pullback on the beginning of the week. What I would say is that, you know, are we going to get a gap fill eventually? Well, I do kind of think that this kind of area personally, uh, let me just change my transition, my charts here. So again, this was the ebb, the ebb and flow of the price movement uh, and, and yesterday finding some support roughly around that same area as we did on Monday morning. But yeah, are we going to get a gap filled down here? I, I don't think so personally. I think that you know, just given, even though, yes, Saudi Arabia, seemingly it seems they can, they can get back on their feet quite quickly, I would say that the geopolitical risk that has now picked up a notch or two on the back of now, where do we go from here? And obviously, the tensions with Iran are not going anywhere anytime soon. I do think that this kind of 58 kind of level here, perhaps a, a decent fair value for the moment with the fundamentals that are in play. Uh, and so I continue to see this as quite a good, strong area of support. If broken, sure. Uh, potentially then on the same factor uh, could get a decent run lower but for the moment I think that's going to be a, a, a pretty uh, a good area where we might start to see a bit of consolidation around between 58 and 60 essentially uh, so with that in mind the pivot of 59.76 today in the futures um, from a trading point of view from the Saudi situation I would say that um, the kind of dramatic moves now now that we've had that news from yesterday 
about the latest uh, kind of tentative timelines about how quickly and to what amount they're going to get production back online. I would say the kind of firepower of the ability of the, the headline news out of that situational region to impact the price may be dissipating a touch uh, on the Saudi stuff. Not unless there is obviously a new attack of some sort and then things could flare up, of course, particularly quickly. Um, just going straight into the news then, let's have a, just a quick overview, as I said, uh, on the Federal Reserve. I'll go into this in much greater detail later this evening. Uh, but a divided Fed may be reluctant to forecast more cuts. This is what Bloomberg are reporting this morning. The FOMC expected to lower rates, but dots may send or <coughs> excuse me, a hawkish signal. Oil price spike reinforces the sense geopolitical risks are rising. So the reason why they're talking about this division is that uh, that was apparent in the last meeting when the Fed uh, chose to cut rates for the first time in this kind of mid-cycle adjustment. And it's believed to be that we're going to see some dissenters today, uh, Esther George and Eric Rosengren, the more outlying hawks, arguing that we do not need to cut at all at this point. Uh, we shouldn't have cut in the first place. And then you've got the likes of Bullard, who typically sits right on the other end of the spectrum, saying that, look, uh, never mind 25, how about 50 basis points? So there definitely is uh, a sense of division. And of course, this does um, come at a time where there's arguments really for both sides. If you think about things like non-farm payrolls, perhaps uh, a little bit softer and has been deteriorating, albeit still holding up at relatively high levels. You've now got this geopolitical renewed risk, perhaps in the Persian Gulf. Uh, you've got the ongoing trade war risk, of course, as well, the kind of uh, the uncertainties around that. However, on the balance, US economic data has definitely been improving um, in terms of when looking at all data sets. And so there's definitely argument to suggest that perhaps, perhaps, we don't even need to cut today at all. What do the markets think? Well, check this out. This has been one of the most uh, rapidly changing graphics I've seen for a Fed decision in quite a while. And if you think about it, rewind the clock about three weeks or so, possibly four, and it wasn't a case of holding rates. It was a case of 25 or 50. You remember when everyone was talking about the inversion of the yield curve and it felt like the media were trying to tell us that the end is nigh and so on. Well, that's disappeared. The inversion of the yield curve no longer is apparent. That has paired back a lot of that move in step with what I've said was improving economic data situation that we've seen in the States. So now forget 50. No one in the market is anticipating 50. And in fact, today has almost become a toss up between it's a, almost a 50 50 bet hold or cut 25. So I am way more excited about tonight now uh, than I was a, a few weeks ago. Because when you see a 56.5 to 43.5% probability, so still t tilted slightly to a cut, either way they go, the market's going to move sharply on that initial announcement, depending on what option they take. But of course, we know with the Federal Reserve, this isn't just about this hike, it's about the subsequent hikes thereafter. So this is looking at where federal funds rate futures implied probabilities put rates at the end of the year. And as you can see here, there's about a 16% probability that markets are expecting rates might remain where they are exactly today. So never mind no cut today, no cut for the rest of the year. Obviously, the further out down the timeline you go, the more risk there are to the accuracy of these numbers, because obviously between now and the end of the year, there's lots of things that could occur to, to change the situation. <coughs> but the way markets are priced today, which is important for ascertaining the reaction function of how assets will move at the initial announcement tonight, it's actually 41.5% most likely that rates will just be one cut lower than where they are today, a range of 1.75 to 2 uh, percent. So, yeah, quite interesting to see how this has shifted. And of course, we get the summary of economic projections later, uh, and then we get the press conference as well. So, we'll, as I said, we'll cover that in full. But it's going to be particularly interesting. Markets right on the fence about what exactly that uh, the initial rate decision is going to be this evening. The other thing, of course, you might have heard about. Quite a lot of people have been talking about this chart. Uh, if it, if it looks frightening, that's probably because it is frightening. It's the US overnight repo rate. 
and it surged. Beginning of the week, it kind of back to back did it again yesterday. Typically, the repo rate is something which kind of trickles along, as you can see here over the last two months, at around the federal funds rate, which is, let's say, 2%, but it's more than five times higher than that as of yesterday, hit 10%. Now, I did send out to you guys this morning an explainer article about what is a repo rate because I've had quite a few questions yesterday. Not a lot of people who are new to markets are too familiar with this process, but it is an absolutely pivotal and essential operational kind of uh, option or, 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 or part of how markets function uh, day to day. And so what I thought I'd do, I'd quickly run through a couple of headlines of what exactly this is just so we're all on point because the Federal Reserve are going to be looking to add more liquidity to the system later today. So when you see those headlines, you're just a little bit more informed about what is going on. So the repo rate talks about um, essentially cash available for banks for their short-term funding. Uh, and as you can see, then as kind of like with the LIBOR rate, if you remember back to the financial crisis or the interbank lending rate, once these rates start to spike higher, it means then that it has an inability for... Um, lenders to lend to one another because you get this kind of credit crunch if you like and so we've had this big surge which means liquidity dries up now that's a big problem because banks need liquidity in order to meet their daily operational needs and maintain sufficient reserves just day to day so what happens as a process is that Wall Street banks uh, they offer US Treasuries and other high quality securities to raise cash more often than not overnight to finance their trading and lending activities. Because remember, financial institutions are not just trading markets. That's only one very small part of what they do. The other big part is lending activities uh, to a variety of different market participants, including other banks, of course. What happens then is the next day, so after they've, uh, they've basically offered these, these assets or collateral to raise cash overnight, the next day borrowers repay their loans plus what it typically is a nominal rate of interest to get their bonds back. So a nominal rate normally would be 2% in line with the federal funds rate. But if it was 10%, well then, wow, there's no way that you would offer to lend that money knowing that you've got to pay back then a 10% premium on it, which is five times more than your regular amount. So what happens is this is a massive risk to markets in terms of the day-to-day -day operational functions of the banking system. And so it forces the Fed to intervene to add emergency liquidity in an injection that they did yesterday of $50 billion. Now, is this the first time that the Fed have had to do this? Absolutely not. They were very active. I remember doing this during the uh, right in the middle of the severity of the global financial crisis back when Lehman's collapsed. As you can imagine, banks were woefully short of liquidity. No other institution wanted to lend to another counterparty. So the Fed had to add liquidity day after day after day. If you bring this into our own, although slightly different um, system, this is when RBS had, what, a hundred billion pound shortfall in meeting its overnight obligations, which is when then uh, obviously the government had to step in uh, the central bank adding short-term liquidity and the government taking ownership of the bank at that point. So, yeah, this, um, uh, is it shocking news? Is it going to move all different assets? No. Is it a factor that could well be brought up in the Q&A with the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell today? Yes. Is it something to monitor going forward? Yes. So it definitely could if it becomes a continuous thing that, that that gets seen every day that means it's another thing that the fed are going to have to throw some monetary power at uh, and obviously it does require large amounts of funding um, so they're looking to conduct another one today and reportedly that's going to be another 75 billion dollars now <coughs> the question might well come why is this happening well there's three main reasons that people from what i've read uh, are pinning this on uh, from this morning, but it is somewhat debatable. Number one is corporations had to withdraw funds from money market accounts to pay quarterly tax bills. So if you think about the actual participants within what makes this repo market function, 
um, their, their liquidity has drawn down because of the fact that they've had to make a, a seasonal quarterly tax bill payment. That also coming on the same days when last week we had 78 billion treasury kind of funding round from the US Treasury. Uh, that means then that all of those banks and investors who bought into those bonds that were sold by the US government last week now have to settle up. So again, we're drawing more liquidity from the system as they make those payments. And then finally, reserves that banks part with the Fed are often made available to other banks on an overnight basis are at their lowest level since 2011. Uh, so again, the amount of reserves generally that banks have available to them to lend to other institutions is the lowest it's been in about eight years. This has come as the Fed have tried to cull a lot of its vast portfolio of bonds that they've accumulated over the last few years through the three phases of quantitative easing post-financial crisis. So all of those three things all equate to withdrawal of liquidity, but importantly, they've all come right at the same time. The latter point probably has been ongoing, but the Treasury funding round from last week, in addition to the quarterly taxable payments from corporations, has led to this funding squeeze and consequently this repo rate surge. Um, do I actually think this will become a bigger thing? No. But what it does actually entail, though, is probably in time some tweaking of monetary policy when we start looking at the more complicated details outside of just normal interest rates and dot plots and so on that they're going to have to change because uh, that this this funding situation is fairly pressured uh, at the moment and will probably likely to continue to do so for some period of time so some changes do need to be made technically to how they operate okay hopefully that makes sense uh, and that's a bit more clearer on what exactly that is final thing just to finish off on my side uh, I did read this this morning uh, looming, looming election in re reference to the UK is set to delay the appointment of Bank of England governor so Mark Carney could be asked to extend his tenure again uh, I think this would be the third time uh, there are uh, other articles on the FT talking about who could be his replacement Andrew Bailey or Ben Broadbent or lots of others as well um, but the point being is that obviously we're coming to this pivotal point of where Brexit could well be delayed again to the end of January uh, of 2020. And so I guess what really would be would be the most prudent thing to do from a planning point of view is have some degree of continuity. So if Carney were to stay, I think that would be the best course of action from a Bank of England's job of market stability point of view. <coughs> um, but if they were to change, then all the more reason why I think they should select someone more organically, perhaps someone like Ben Broadbent, um, because he's been part of the top level decision making through the process and he'll know uh, the kind of tact and uh, guidance that very closely that Carney has been deploying. OK, calendar wise today, and then I'll hand you over to Sam. What have we got? So UK CPI data is coming out later this morning. Um, could that be market moving? Well, sure, it could be, but um, only would I would say if it was way out of the um, consensus estimates. We got a range of 1.6 to 2.2 at the high. The, <coughs> the expectation year on year is 1.9 percent. So um, I would watch that. I certainly would say stay clear of having any position on while the data comes out, but. Yeah, it would need to be down at the 1.5% kind of reading or up at the 2.4%, I think, really to see a, a decent move in markets. Just because everyone's sidetracked by political ongoings UK-wise and the Fed decision looming dollar-wise. CPI comes, of course, alongside RPI and PPI. Uh, so all at 9.30, then get Eurozone final CPI. So again, final reading is likely to not move the market then for that reason. This afternoon, US building permits, housing starts for August, Canadian inflation data, weekly um, oil inventories. So I will um, post those API numbers into the chat room. Uh, I'll get Sam to cover those in a second. Um, and then you've got the FOMC decision, of course, happening later on with Fed Chair Powell to back that up with the press conference at 7.30.
But again, we will cover that. 6.30, we go live on YouTube, so hopefully you can join us. Uh, there will be a, a chat function, ability to ask questions as well, so happy to help um, kind of guide you through that volatility when the release comes out. Good stuff. All right, I'll hand you over to Sam, and I wish you a good day ahead until that time. Thanks very much. Yeah, hi guys. Hope we're, we're all doing well and, and ready for uh, this evening. Uh, so we'll come on the mic closer to the time uh, and then on, on YouTube as well. Where we'll go through some of uh, the levels of, of how we're trading going into uh, the event. Uh, before we get on to the main dollar-related markets, we'll have a, a quick look over at oil, which you can see a couple of times really you know, had a, had a go at trying to break through the uh, the low that we've, we've had and, and we reached on, on Monday morning, obviously that being the, the high that we had back on the 10th, was it the 10th? 31st, sorry. Uh, yeah, and then it was the 10th, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, that held well and, and then since then we've, we've had a, another go at trying to break through some of these levels and just can't get, get, uh, get down there for that gap fill, you know, obviously looking at this more technically uh, as well. I think that's going to remain to be uh, a trade opportunity if we were to potentially get uh, the uh, maybe the DOE's overly bearish you know could get through there if you have some big dollar strength as well that could come through later on and and obviously it's a big big uh, push down to where we finished Friday around 54.85 uh, on the futures. Last night's uh, DOE numbers coming in well, the headline, which was expected to be a draw of, of minus 2.5, coming in at a build of just over half a million, 592. Uh, Cushing was a draw uh, of minus 846. Gasoline, a build of 1.6 mil, and distillate build as well. If we have a look at the, uh, that, uh, well, I'll have to zoom in here, and it's a standard uh, sort of API-sized candle. Uh, you can see here, so relatively small, relatively contained, slightly mixed uh, on the uh, on that reading there. Of course, bigger things going on uh, at the moment. And just the way oil is looking, obviously talking about that gap fill, if you like, but also you can see just from this morning, we're starting to, to get that trend to the upside. And oil, like gold, is one of those markets that when you do get a, a strong trend developing in the morning, it offers a good opportunity for that breakthrough. Uh, to the downside as well. Looking uh, at some of the levels from, from yesterday and around the pivot and, and sort of $60, you've got uh, yesterday evening's uh, sort of resistance on the pivot, which looks quite good. And uh, not that we're going to get up to that R1, but you can remember yesterday we were talking just about uh, the, the neckline, if you like, from the, what was the, the double top. Uh, obviously, we've moved contracts here, so it looks slightly different now. Uh, but that break of that, of course, coupled in with the the Saudi headline saw a decent push to the downside. So a couple of interesting levels to, to have marked up there for oil. Currency wise, uh, let's have a quick look just where we're trading. If I put this on a 240 chart, you can see the euro here. Again, it's a market that just couldn't like the pound break that low and we couldn't then again to the upside get above some resistance that we had back on the 29th. So, so we're sort of stuck within this range uh, from 110.11 to 111.80, uh, which, you know, ahead of a, a central bank a meeting of this significance isn't all too surprising, uh, to be honest. And you can see over the last, if I just put this on back to a 60, you can see over the last sort of couple of sessions, we're just getting starting to again develop different trend lines from these highs, and you can see. Uh, relatively well respected to, to that side there so looking maybe break of there yesterday's highs and then you're looking at the the highs of the week uh, to the downside you've got some interesting levels just below I would say the the pivot where we've had decent price action around 111.14 so as a line in the sand for the morning it's not too bad but really I would be more focusing on and just sort of holding off and, and waiting for for really this, this evening uh, so in the build up uh, 6.30 to 7 o'clock uh, when the headline comes out and then obviously the press conference 30 minutes later would really just be you know, prepping for then uh, if you like. Other key levels to be aware of just to the downside again just below that S1 previous high of yesterday and I also do quite like the look of what was yesterday's low uh, and also the low of the 11th I think that's a, a pretty key area to have on uh, as well. Pound obviously with the Fed later um, you know the pound is going to move but probably not to the extent that uh, euro dollar is it's still going to be brexit 
the main driver here focus rightly so should be elsewhere and and yesterday's low we we got uh, a test just after the briefing really of the level we were talking about and that those those high from the ninth uh, and all the other highs as well and the retest of that trend line obviously was something that would probably be uh, you know to, to be discussed at a later event that coming in at s1 today but uh, for now good support held up there uh, and now you could also argue that if we were to get any further push uh, below this pivot and 125 taking into account the highs that we had from overnight yesterday uh, and yesterday morning which comes in just above the S1 so some nice support just below we're trading uh, the failure really to to break above the, the high that we had on the 13th on Friday uh, has seen us drift lower and if we put this onto the 15 minute you can see as well just perhaps at some point we're going to start to make this other trend here uh, as well to, to keep uh, a watch on. As with uh, any break lower in the morning you can see here worth having on that trend line as well that's where the move just uh, on the open uh, really push lower so a retest of that is of course something to have marked up so rather than maybe attacking the pivot even though technically it's not too bad I would prefer to look to get short a bit higher up on that. S&P really I mean yesterday was pretty quiet uh, on the S&P the range from the the high to the low pretty small 93 to 09 so 16 points um, you know maybe we would have loved that back in 2017 but we sort of got used to the S&P actually really moving now uh, that gap feel has, has really taken place though of course and uh, from overnight on the weekend uh, we couldn't really you know push lower at all and you can see again this trend line worth having on from the low that we had back on Monday as well just to, to really get things squeezed in if we can get a confirmed break above 09 then you know why can't we get the highest from last week where we obviously got very big resistance level um, you know I've seen some tweets yesterday that people are, are reckoning we're going all-time highs today just the way we're, we're sort of priced in and the unwind of this rate cut and you can see if we have a look at this that uh, longer term chart with the all-time high in the mix you can see how close we are percent wise roughly do this as 0.9 so I could easily do that in a day can the same levels uh, as usual to the downside obviously the, the 46 to have up and then this trend line that we're starting to get starting from the, the 10th of September uh, but as mentioned we'll go through all of these in more detail ahead of the time uh, as this morning I would prioritize more a case of just sort of prepping and planning uh, for, for the session uh, ahead obviously you've got the, the UK data out in nine as well but uh, main focus is going to be elsewhere gold as well you can see quite choppy uh, quite range bound that obviously the lows that we can call it 1494 very key but also here I was looking yesterday with the uh, the new guys in in stage one of the uh, the career program and just talking about the significance of this whole area you can call it 89 to the 93 94 point just such good support you know a break of that later and you know a no rate cut and potentially a bit more hawkish on the, the press conference and projections could, could really see us push down and I, I think we could have quite a quick move down to sort of 68 and and 60 so certainly a, a key zone that I would have marked up on the flip side you know if they were to uh, go more down the, the dovish route you know a key uh, resistance level to, to the upside at 1525 uh, I don't think it's out of the question that uh, 89 or 25 gets tested today I think it could be a, a really good meeting um, so please you know, do join us later on just having a quick look over the bund you can see pushing up uh, this morning so worth having this trend line drawn on from the last couple of days uh, that's probably not far off you know getting tested with uh, sort of the lows that we had back on Friday and obviously the high of yesterday as well T notes following suit up to its high after we said it was the worst week since November 2016 we have just been drifting probably worth even seeing if there's a bit of a trend channel on this at some point uh, if we were to make another low uh, so bonds just pushing to uh, to the upside there any questions as usual please uh, do let us know I hope you have a, a good day and, and feel free to, to join us later on in, in what should be a, a pretty good meeting